Good afternoon, thank you very much for joining us for the second European Law interview. It is sponsored by the Jean Monnet Chair, which is promoting uh, innovating learning programs related to EU studies. We have the great opportunity today to have a very special guest, Professor Nicolas de Sadler. He is Professor in EU Law and Environmental Law at Université Saint-Louis and Université Catholique de Louvain. Good morning, Professor. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we will discuss today um, the case law uh, related to Article 34 and Article 35 of the TFEU. We will start by a short uh, reminder of one of the most important cases, so the Keck and Mitois case. So basically this case was about two gentlemen, Mr. Keck and Mr. Mitois, who were reselling products at a price lower than the purchasing price. And in this very important case, the European Court of Justice uh, defined two very important notions, selling arrangements and product requirements. So going back to Keck, can you please uh, tell me why selling arrangements have been excluded? Yes, the court was afraid to enlarge the scope of ambit of Article 34 to such an extent that a number of key domestic regulations were likely to, uh, to, to, to be uh, qualified as measures having uh, equivalent effect for the purpose of Article 34. Needless to say that uh, Keck and Mitoir judgment has been ducked ever since by controversy. Uh, it goes without saying that the case law is narrowing down the scope of Article 34 in removing selling arrangement so long as there is equal impact on both domestic and imported goods. So of interest uh, is that uh, the case law is placing emphasis upon factual and legal equality to the detriment of a market access test. Um, after the judgment was handed down, uh, many academics took the view uh, that the um, judgment and the subsequent case law was running counter uh, to this access, uh, market access uh, test uh, which is much more favorable to traders. Um, so uh, there were many lawyers uh, and academics, uh, even advocate generals, calling for reform of the uh, selling arrangement case law. Uh, thank you. Do you mind giving an example of what is a selling arrangement and another example of what a product requirement is? Yeah, I take your point entirely. Um, selling arrangements in the environmental field uh, are likely to cover uh, regulations that determine the person uh, who is authorized to sell products entailing risk, where these products can be placed on the market or when they can be placed on the market. For, for instance, in several member states, game products cannot be placed on the market uh, the whole year round. Uh, they can be placed on the market exclusively during the hunting period with a view to preventing poachers uh, to uh, introduce game uh, during the non-hunting period. Mm -hmm. um, in contrast, uh, product requirements will deal with the dimensions, the weight, the form, the size, uh, the composition, the uh, labeling, the presentation of the products. As far as environmental issues are concerned, um, bans on the product, restrictions on the use, uh, registration, uh, authorizations, emissions um, restrictions, uh, would be qualified as product requirements and so uh, would fall uh, within the scope of ambit of Article 34. Uh, so by way of example, in the uh, Bloom case on the Danish bees, um, the Court of Justice uh, stressed that the prohibition to import on the island of Leso bees from the continent was not a selling arrangement, but was uh, a product requirement. 
um, by the same token in a case commission versus Italy uh, the Court of Justice took the view that requirements on labeling on batteries was indeed a product requirement but not a selling arrangement. Does it mean that most regulations are on products requirements? Yes, indeed, in the environmental field 99% of the state measures uh, are related to uh, either plant or installation requirements or product requirements. So there the are rather few selling arrangements or restrictions in the environmental field. Okay, thank you. We will now move to uh, another set of very important judgments, so the Swedish watercraft judgment and the trailer's judgment. I will uh, briefly summarize the facts of the Swedish watercraft's uh, judgment. So basically there was a Swedish rule that was uh, limiting the use of watercrafts in Sweden. Uh, they could only be used on um, general navigable waterways, but there was no such thing as a general navigable waterway in Sweden. Is that correct? Uh, it's slightly more complex than this. Of course. Um, there was a general prohibition. That prohibition was subject to derogations. And uh, as you stressed, it was possible to use the watercrafts um, within the navigable areas. Um, the difficulty lies on the fact that at that time the areas were not designated in their own rights. Uh, so Mr. Roos and Mr. Mickelson were arrested in practicing their sport in an area close to Luleå mm -hmm. in northern Sweden uh, that were not designated as such. So they were infringing the uh, Swedish rules on the use of watercrafts. Okay, so these two judgments have brought a new category. So now we have what we call the three-pronged approach. Can you please uh, explain the three categories? Yes, uh, one should take into consideration that the Swedish watercraft case um, is mirroring a judgment that was handed down by the General Court on the 10th of February 2009 in Commission versus Italy or the traders case, um, a case related to the prohibition for motopeds uh, to bring uh, traders. And so the Court of Justice on the 10th of February 2009, as well as on the 4th June 2009 in the uh, Michaels, uh, Michelson and Rose case, made far-reaching changes to the two-pronged approach differentiating between selling arrangement on the one hand and product requirements on the other. So three categories were identified by the courts. The first category encompasses all national measures whose object or effect treat less favorably foreign products. So the emphasis is being placed upon direct as well as indirect discrimination. The second category encompasses all measures where there is no harmonization whatsoever that regulate product requirements irrespective of whether these measures are indistinctly applicable. And last but not least, the third category encompasses any measures which hinders access of foreign products to the national market. So all in all, the first category is mirroring the principle of non-discrimination. The second category enshrines the principle of mutual recognition that was proclaimed by the court in Cassis de Dijon. And finally, the third category encapsulates this access uh, of products to national markets. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the third category is the most innovative and perhaps the most uh, critical one. 
Okay, if we go back uh, to the beginning, so for the first category, do measures have to aim to discriminate against foreign products? No, in fact, they can uh, indirectly or potentially uh, discriminate uh, foreign products. But the first category uh, does encompass measures whose object or effect is to treat less favorably mm -hmm. um, uh, foreign products uh, in favor to domestic production. Okay, thank you. Um, let's move to the new feature of the case law that was discovered in those two cases. Can you please uh, develop a bit? Yes, of importance is that uh, for the very first time the Court of Justice had to adjudicate in these two cases measures regulating the use of products. Uh, so far 99% of the cases dealt with uh, placing on the market or restrictions or authorizations or bans uh, whatsoever. Uh, here the case law dealt with uh, new types of measures that were not uh, addressed so far in their own rise, that's the use of the products. And so the, the court took the view that uh, several types of restrictions placed on the use of products uh, could run counter to Article 34. Firstly, measures that do uh, completely prohibit the use of a product. For instance, uh, I am owning um, uh, a gun, but I'm unable to shoot with that gun. So the, 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 the possibility to own the gun is authorized, but the use of the gun is prohibited. So that means that the, given that the complete use uh, is prohibited, uh, there is no need to purchase the gun. We will now move to the third category um, of measures. Uh, is it a new feature of the case law? Yes, I indeed. I it's fair to say that the third category covers non-discriminatory measures which do not fall within the scope of ambit of the two first categories. Uh, in effect, Article 34 in the light of the third category, covers all national measures uh, other than product requirements, other than discriminatory measures, which impede access to the domestic market. Admittedly, uh, measures like uh, authorization requirements or restrictions on use of the product or restrictions on the transport of the products are likely to fall within the scope of ambit of this uh, novel feature of the case law. So we often refer to the uh, market access test. Can you please tell us how we have to interpret this test? Well, I imagine that lawyers uh, will be at loggerheads in the future uh, regarding the interpretation to be given to this uh, concepts. Uh, many lawyers are already taking the view that the concept should be broadly uh, interpreted. Uh, I'm taking the view that uh, the concept should be uh, interpreted in a rather narrow way given the broad interpretation already given to the two first categories. Uh, one should bear in mind that Article 34 is about removing restriction on trade and is not about deregulations. Mm -hmm. So one should not confuse issues of deregulations with uh, the basic approach endorsed under Article 34 and that's to remove barriers to trade. Okay, C can you please tell us what does the term access exactly mean? Well, <laughs> some lawyers are, are taking the view that uh, already under Dassonville, given that Dassonville is so broad, it encompasses 
uh, any measures that's likely to hinder trade directly or indirectly, actually or potentially. Well, there was already somewhat a market access test uh, in that. So, is there a revolution? Uh, is there a revolution with uh, the Italian? Uh, traders case or the uh, Swedish world case that remains to be seen uh, all, uh, all in all it depends uh, the scope of ambits to be given to this third category okay thank you so uh, one related question is uh, linked to selling arrangements can you please tell me what the fate of selling arrangements is well uh, selling arrangements do not disappear as such so member states are still uh, empowered to escape the codine forks of Article 34 in uh, setting up uh, restrictions on selling arrangements, in as much as these selling arrangements uh, restrictions do not discriminate uh, foreign products or foreign producers. So the new case law is not calling into question cake and mitoire. So cake and mitoire uh, must be uh, regarded as a part of the uh, new trilogy. Okay, and then what do you think would be the consequences of a broad interpretation of the market access test, basically? Well, I imagine that a too broad interpretation of that test uh, will allow uh, national courts uh, to call into questions uh, many uh, national regulations uh, aiming at uh, protecting uh, teenagers against uh, health risk or uh, aiming at protecting uh, the quality of the environment. So again, uh, it's fair to say that Article 34 is not about deregulating the domestic economy. Okay, so if I understand you well, we first had with Keke Mitoir a two-pronged approach with selling arrangements and product requirements, and then there was a case law evolution with Swedish watercrafts and trailers, and now we have discrimination, mutual recognition, and then uh, market access. We will now move to another feature of uh, this case law, the use of products, if you don't mind. Yes, in, indeed, indeed. In fact, uh, the uh, both traders as well as the Swedish watercraft uh, judgment address uh, a new issue: that the restrictions placed upon the use of the products. So, in the Italian, in the Commission versus Italy case, the Italian measures dealt with the prohibition of the use of motorpeds. On motorways uh, and other um, uh, highways. Uh, whereas under the Swedish case, uh, the use of, uh, of watercrafts in Sweden uh, was subject to uh, significant restrictions. So uh, for the very first time, the Court of Justice had to adjudicate whether these restrictions placed on the use of different categories of products was running counter Article 34. So, to cut a long story short, the court is no longer dealing with product requirements only, but also with the measures regulating the use of products. Yes, that, that's why um, in the first opinion given by Advocate General Julian Cocotte, she stressed that uh, the, the situations uh, the Court of Justice was facing in these two cases was tantamount to selling arrangements restrictions. So uh, we are not dealing here with product requirements, we are dealing whenever the product has already been placed on the market with further restrictions not on the placing of, on the market but on the use that can be done of the product at issue. And do we uh, deal with measures prohibiting the use of a product or also with measures restricting the use of a product? Well, the Italian case dealt with 
a full prohibition of the use of trailers by motopeds. The Swedish measures was much more complex given that the prohibition was far from being absolute. Uh, a number of derogations were provided for uh, the use of uh, watercrafts uh, within specific uh, areas which were not national parks or nature sanctuaries. So the, the Court of Justice uh, distinguished between, firstly, uh, measures prohibiting the use of a product, secondly, measures preventing users of the products for the specific purpose for which the products were intended, and thirdly, measures that are greatly restricting the use of a product. And what are the consequences of those new findings on environmental and health policies? Well, let's take the, the case of a full prohibition of, um, of the use. Just by way of illustration, uh, the case of hunting gun. Uh, in Brussels, hunting practice has been uh, prohibited for a number of decades, unfortunately, <laughs> for the people living in the city. Uh, so people are allowed uh, to purchase uh, hunting guns in as much as they go hunting in Flanders or in Wallonia. But they cannot use the guns uh, to shoot at crows or at pigeons uh, in the parks or in the uh, gardens. So th there is a full prohibition. So uh, needless to say, why on earth am I going to purchase a hunting gun in Brussels when I cannot hunt in the city. Of course. So uh, the food prohibition is akin to uh, the impossibility to place on the market uh, the product. Uh, other restrictions placed by the court are much more complex. Um, so the, the court is stressing uh, measures greatly restricting the use of a product. What are we talking uh, about? Uh, is a measure limiting by 25% or by 50% uh, the use of a product tantamount to a measure having equivalent effect? That, that's an open question. Okay. So I have no answer to that so far. And I, I imagine that the court uh, will have to um, answer further questions that will be begged by national courts on the matter. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. Um, this is the end of our uh, second uh, European law interview. So we discussed the case law and the evolution of the case law uh, related to Article uh, 34 and Article 35 of the TFEU. So basically, if we go back to Keck and Mitwa, uh, we have two categories. Um, so basically selling arrangements and products requirements. Then there was an evolution with cases like trailers and Swedish watercrafts. And we moved to uh, categories with first discrimination, then mutual recognition, and finally uh, market access, uh, the market access category. And these uh, judgments also bring new findings regarding the use uh, of products. We have settled a case law on measures uh, totally prohibiting the use of a good or a product, but it's much more, um, yeah, it's less clear, sorry, um, about uh, measures uh, partially restricting the use of a product, and we are still waiting uh, for new cases to back the findings of the courts. Um, this interview was sponsored by the Jean Monnet Chair. We will see you uh, next time for an interview on exports and more precisely on Article 35 of the TFEU. For more information, please um, visit our website www.tradeversusenvironment.eu. Bye!